Good morning and welcome to the third lecture. Okay, so here's the, here's the lecture outline where, where, where we are in the big picture. Um, we have started talking about, uh, or asking what, what is the Higgs boson and why should we go to such great lengths to, to find it. Um, and we had started giving a partial, partial answer of why in the first lecture, the fact that it looked like we have scientific explanations that are responsible for all the phenomena around us. And it's sort of converging to a common, might be a common source. And that, that particle physics is really at the, at the bottom at the bottom of that, that convergence. And we'll see that more, more concretely um, in today's lecture. Uh, we then talked about the basic, the basic inputs, um, the basic language in which to, which, which to describe the story of the Higgs. And that was quantum mechanics and special relativity. Um, and then last week we talked about combining the two. So of course, you know, our world is both relativistic and quantum mechanical, so those theories have to have to work at the same time. Um, and so today, and so but that was really all about all possible worlds. So what what anything you know, any conceivable world that is relativistic and quantum mechanics would have to look like. Today we'll get more specific. We'll talk about the world that we that we live in. Of course, it's 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 subject to those rules and constraints um, that we talked about. Yeah, so maybe we can talk about that, talk about that at the end. Yeah. Okay, um, so the plan for this week is to talk about what the world actually, actually is. It's the same sources here. Um, so just a reminder from, from last lecture, um, we, we, had, we had spoke about how it looks, it looks like the binary seems impossible at first, right? They, they have, those two different frameworks have very different languages, and they seem incompatible. And so, and one way that, that we talked about in detail was this issue of causality. It looked like um, if if you combine the two, this notion that that what happens next is only depends on what happened in the past would be violated. Um, and there was and there was a way out, right? And there was, but just barely. Um, and that way out made a dramatic prediction that there was antiparticles, and these must exist. Um, and at the time, they actually weren't known to exist. So this was seen as seemed to be a big black eye against the theory. But they were very uh, soon after uh, discovered. Um, and this also, in turn, has major implications for the vacuum. So we talked about this as well. Um, so the fact that there are antiparticles means that if you have energy that's located um, in a very small region of space, there's nothing preventing you from creating um, a pair of uh, particle and antiparticle pair. Okay? And given by the uncertainty principle, when you get to distances that are comparable with 1 over the the energy that you would need to probe that region, you could get you could get pairs of the, either electrons at one over the mass of the electron, or you could get muon pairs coming in at smaller at smaller distances. Okay, and we'll see how, we'll see how this plays a major role in our discussion today. Um, I also just flashed at the end other implications for for uh, for combining quantum mechanics and relativity, um, and so really. Um, if you think about quantum mechanics, it, it's, it says if you know what the amplitude is at, at a certain time, and you know what the interactions are, you can predict what would happen at a later time. Uh, but of course, relativity says if, if, if someone is moving, the times will be different. Okay, and so this means that for most uh, for most for most interactions, a moving observer would, would come to a different different conclusion. Okay, that you get different probabilities for things to happen, which would be which would be inconsistent. Um, and so there's a way out. Basically, I, I, mean, I didn't go through this, but the way to think about it is most interactions are, are dip, moving observers would get different, different results, but there are a small subset of interactions that look the same to all observers. So if you only allow those types of interactions, then you can have both relativity and quantum mechanics um, at the same time. Um, and so those, and the restrictions on those interactions are, are listed here. Uh, if you have particles that, that, are, that have integer spin, they have to be bosons. Particles of half integer spin have to be fermions. And moreover, you can't just have any spins you want. So quantum mechanics told us that the spins had to be quantized. Um, combining it with relativity says that you can only have these, the small list of spins okay, that are possible. Uh, and there's also major uh, constraints on the type of interactions that, that are allowed. So if you have a notion of a charge, like an electric charge, or, or other charges that mediate um, forces, that, that has to be conserved. Okay? And the interactions have to be local in space-time. Now, we'll talk about that in more detail today. 
Um, and another thing is that you're only allowed to have certain interactions, okay? So, so these, so here this is bosons and fermions. You can only have two bosons meet at a point and go into two other bosons, or two bosons meet at a point and go into one boson, or two fermions and one boson. So those are the only um, interactions that are possible. We'll talk in more detail about what these, these stick figures mean uh, today. Okay, so so today's lecture we're going to talk about what, what, is, what the world is made of, what, what sorts of interactions are, are present around us, and how it translates into this language that, that we talked about in the first two lectures. Okay, we'll start with just the stuff in, 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 um, in the universe, of the world. Um, so, of course, we know that everything is made of atoms, right? And we talked about this previous lecture. Atoms are made of electrons and uh, nucleus. Okay, so the electrons are, are negatively charged. They're responsible for most of the space of, of the atoms or most of the volume. Um, these are thought to be fundamental entities. Okay, so they really enter, enter our theory, this, 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 this quantum field theory, as, um, as fundamental particles, and there's been no sign of substructure to electrons that, that we know of. The nucleus, uh, on the other hand, is positively charged. Okay? It's responsible for most of the mass of the atom, so most of the weight of things, things around. Um, for, for, for a long time, it was thought to be uh, fundamental, um, but it's since been shown to be made of other things, so pro in particular protons and neutrons. These, again, there was a history where, where this was thought maybe it, that these, these things are fundamental, uh, but these have been shown to be made of quarks, and we'll talk later uh, of other, other things. Um, and now these, these quarks are thought to be fundamental entities, okay? So they enter the theory that we'll talk about as fundamental units, and there's been no sign um, of substructure or um, uh, of, of, of quarks. So these are, these are what we call matter particles, these, these electrons and quarks. They're fermions, okay? And so remember from the previous lecture, fermions are things that, if you have a large collection of them, behave like classical particles. So they behave like bricks or baseballs, um, which makes sense because these, you know, bricks and baseballs are made of, made of atoms. Okay, so, so that's, that's what the things in the world are. There's also forces, so they, 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 they interact with, you know, these objects interact with one another. Um, so the first force that, um, the, that, uh, that was known is gravity, okay? So this is something that's really apparent in our everyday lives. It's been known since antiquity and, and before that. Um, Newton is, this was the first force that we really formalized in terms of mathematical laws. There's this famous inverse square law that Newton taught us about. Um, gravity is always attractive, okay, so things that, that have mass always uh, tend, to, tend to fall towards each other. Um, and this force is totally irrelevant for um, subatomic particles and for the, for the Higgs, okay. And so we'll come back to this maybe in another lecture. It's really shockingly small. And the only reason it, um, it shows up in our everyday lives is because it's always attractive. Okay, so forces, um, different particles can't cancel. They always, they always add up. So if you have huge collections of, of, um, of particles with mass, then you can build a big force. But in terms of subatomic particles, it's, it's totally, um, totally irrelevant. There's electromagnetism, okay, another, another force that, that we all know about. This is also known since, since antiquity. Uh, also has an inverse square law. So naively, it looks similar to gravity. However, in, in detail, it's quite different. So for one thing, it, it can be either attractive or repulsive, depending on the charges. So you have, a pop, you have things that have positive charge and negative. Um, and it is important for, for, for small particles. It's much stronger than gravity. Um, so in particular, it's the thing that holds uh, electrons within, within atoms. So the other forces came along much, much later to the game. Uh, so the third one that we'll talk about is the strong force. This was sort of discovered early 1900s. Um, it really only operates at shorter distances. This is one of the reasons why it wasn't known, wasn't known beforehand. Um, there's really no simple mathematical relationship for this. It's you know, quite, quite complicated. Uh, but it has a very important role in, in, in the world as well. So first, it's responsible for holding together nu the nucleus. Okay? So you could have nucleus, nuclei that are made of multiple protons. So the electromagnetic force wants to drive these protons apart that have the same charge. So there must be another force that's, that's uh, counteracting that, that repulsive force, and that is the strong force. Um, as we'll see later, it's also responsible for essentially all of the mass of, of matter in, of, around us. Okay, so almost all the weight of everything is coming from the strong force. Okay, so it's 
also uh, obviously incredibly important. Um, then there's the weak interaction. This is the fourth uh, last interaction that we know about. This, this also was, came late to the game, so discovered um, sort of just before the turn of the 20th century. Uh, it also looks nothing like the others. Um, it's, it's responsible for radioactive decay. Okay, again, this, um, you know, although we didn't know about it for a long time, it's very important uh, for, for the everyday world. It, it, it's critical for what, what powers the sun and also uh, heats the earth. Um, it's also, also critical. So these forces are all important. It's not like we can really neglect, neglect any of these. Um, and they all look different, very different from one another. Okay, so now, whatever theory we have has to explain, has to explain these, these forces and this, um, and this matter. Um, and as I said, our world is both relativistic and quantum mechanical. So whatever theory we, we have is described in, in terms of the, the general principles that we talked about in the first few lectures. That is this quantum field theory. Um, and so the particular version of the quantum field theory, and it'll be clear what I mean by that uh, as we go on, um, that, that was found to describe our universe and the things in it was really developed in, in the 1960s and 70s. Okay, and so there's all, you know, we often have this, this flowering language about um, how accurate science, our, our scientific theories are, and really this is, this is the hallmark, um, this is the hallmark of that. So this, it's the, one of the most, essentially the most accurate theory we have in all the science. It describes matter um, and all the interactions that I that we talked about earlier down to distances that are uh, 100 times smaller than the proton. Um, and it's very accurate um, and precise. Uh, it gives an accurate, precise description of all observed particle interactions in, uh, in the laboratory. So we'll see examples of this explicitly, explicitly here. OK, so now I want to talk a bit about what you know, how we actually use the theory to make predictions. Okay, so it, it, of course, it's quantum mechanical, so it can only predict probabilities for certain things to happen. So here's an example, and we actually looked at these type of diagrams before. Um, so here you have space um, on one axis and time on the other. And so because the world is quantum mechanical, you don't know exactly where something is and what direction it's, it's moving. So you have to only consider these, these sort of blob diagrams. Uh, but the theory is able to predict probabilities for, for certain processes like this to, to occur. Okay, and so one, things, one of the things that happens in this theory um, is that we, now we draw diagrams like this. So now time is on this, this axis and space is on that axis, so I will use this convention for now on. So that's a trivial thing. Um, but so what we do is we draw these stick figure, these stick figure diagrams that, that are referred to as Feynman diagrams. So we'll talk a lot about these today. So it's hard to see this, um, but I think it'll only be on this slide. So, so what we do here is we show um, it, possible examples of what could happen. So the electron could move like this, interact here, and then go down here, emitting a photon. Okay, so this is one possible, one possible way that, that this, this process could happen. Um, and the theory, this quantum field theory, assigns a, a number to each of these stick figures. Okay, each of these stick figures that interact only at points in space-time. Yeah. Um, so each of these diagrams only have, have these local interactions. So the th what the theory tells us is to draw every single diagram here that's consistent with this red blob. Okay, each of those gives a number. You add all those numbers up. Um, and that gives a contribution to this amplitude. So I'll talk more later about the other contributions to it. But you should think for now that this is basically how you, you calculate the amplitude. You draw every possible stick figure. Okay. The theory gives you a number for each stick figure, and you add all those numbers up, and that gives you that gives you the amplitude. Um, and so from now from now on, I will just use these stick figures. Okay, I'll just say um, the process is represented by, by a stick figure like this. But you should remember, you know, what I really mean here is we draw every stick figure that's consistent with this red um, with these red blobs, and we add those up. We have to add all of those all those different stick figures up. Okay, so, so, so one thing that, that, that comes out almost immediately from the theory is that all these forces that we, that we talked about um, that have long-range interactions, right? So if you remember the inverse square law seems to suggest if you move something that's very far away, the force changes, um, and it looks like you have this action at a distance. Um, this is no longer there, okay? So now all, all, the, all the, the forces are seen to be manifestations of stick figure diagrams that look like this. Okay, so this is an example for electromagnetism. So the interaction of one electron, um, the electromagnetic force with another, 
um, is, comes about from the exchange of a photon. So from local interactions of one photon with another, uh, with, with another electron. Okay, um, and so we, we say that uh, the electromagnetic force is really this exchange of the photon. Okay. So it turns out that this is the case for all the forces. So they all are seen to be results of these stick figure like stick figure like diagrams. So this is the electromagnetic interaction with the photon that we just looked at. Um, the gravitational interaction would be the same thing, but there's another particle, the graviton. Okay, so it's, it's the gravitational interaction between two electrons is just the exchange of this particle. I won't say anything more about gra um, gravity here because it's, because it's so relevant in, um, uh, to particles, uh, to subatomic particles. And these other forces are the same. Okay, so for the strong interaction, it's the same thing. So the strong force only acts upon the quarks, um, but, the, but the way it would interact would be the exact same. So it would exchange another particle, uh, the quark in this case, and the same for the weak interaction. Okay, so for the weak interaction, there's actually two, two sort of two, two kinds. There's, there's a kind that's just analogous to, to electromagnetic interaction, except the exchanges with, with a, a particle that we call the Z boson. I'm be clear when you buy this in the next slides. Um, but there's another type where you can also, you can also, an electron can actually change into a different particle and, and emit it, uh, a different sort of force carrier than the W. Okay, so these force particles are, are all bosons, okay? Um, and you can have a hint that, that this would be the case because we know that large collections of these bosons behave like classical waves, okay? And in fact, light was seen to be a form of a classical wave. Okay, these, these force particles, the gluon, WZ photon um, are all believed to be fundamental as well. They enter our theory as fundamental entities, and there's no sign that they have any substructure um, with them either. Okay, so I, one thing I want to point out here is that, you know, of course these these interactions are all of the type fermion, fermion boson, um, and this, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by this. This this was forced on us by the basic principles um, of quantum mechanics about it. So we, only these sorts of interactions are allowed uh, with with fermions. Okay, another thing I want to point out here, I won't go into very much detail in these lectures, but I just, just want to point it out, is that for the weak interaction, you require a new, new form of matter, a new, new type of matter particle that interacts with this W boson. Um, this is called a neutrino. Okay, it's also a fermion, so also a matter, matter-like particle. Um, it's needed to describe, you know, the radioactive decays. Um, it's, you should think of it as just like an electron, except it has no charge and it has essentially no mass. Um, it's also believed to be fundamental. Okay, so you might think that, that so here's the standard model essentially. It's, it's a description of the types of matter particles that exist, so the stuff in the world. These are fermions, um, and the type of interactions and each, associated with each one of these is another particle that's a boson. Uh, the fermions we group into two sort of categories. We have things that, that feel the strong interaction, those are the, those are the quarks. Um, and things that don't, those are the leptons. Uh, so, the, so, so the strong interaction will bind you know, these objects together, and that will give, us, will give us the nuclei. And the electromagnetic interaction uh, of the electron with, with this bound state would give us the atom. Okay? Um, they're grouped like, and, and we, we put these, you know, these pair together like this because the weak force, as we just saw, can, allows you to trade an electron for a neutrino, and similarly can trade these two among, among them, themselves. Okay, so there's, so in terms of the interactions, um, if, if we would actually go through and do calculations, we would need to understand the, the mathematics behind it. Um, it's actually quite beautiful mathematics that's, that's, that's fairly complicated. It's not, you know, it's not so complicated. It's, it's mathematics that was developed in the, sort of the um, 19th century. Um, that, that, that governs these interactions, okay? Um, and so what I'll, what I'll just say about it is that really symmetry is king for these, for these, um, for this mathematics. So it's really dictated by basic principles of symmetry. So, so you would, essentially what we do is impose certain uh, symmetry relations among the forces, so how you can trade one particle for the other, and that really dictates the type of mathematical uh, structures that you can have um, in, in the calculations. Um, and actually much of this, you know, much of what symmetries are allowed is also a direct consequence of putting together quantum mechanics and relativity. So it's not a, such a big surprise that, that what symmetries that we find in nature 
are there because they're, they're demanded by these, these basic principles as well. Okay, so you, you might naively think that this is everything in, in, in the world, right? So this has all, all the stuff around us, all of the forces. However, um, it was observed that there's, there's other copies of the matter particles. Okay, so what we say, we have other generations. So there's three, three copies of, of the leptons and three copies of the quarks. Uh, and we don't really have any understanding of why this is. Okay, so these are, are essentially totally irrelevant for our everyday lives. Uh, we'll see in the next slide, these things have, have uh, higher masses or heavier than, than the first generation particles. So they immediate, almost immediately decay back to things in the first generation. So they're unstable. So that's why they're not, not relevant for our everyday life. Um, but in terms, in terms of the, the underlying theory, we think these are just as fundamental as the things in the first generation. Okay, here you see the masses for, for all these particles. Um, it has this, these funny units. You can ignore these for now. We'll talk about them later. But here's the proton mass it's sitting here. Um, and what you can see, there's some, you know, and so here, here are the, all the particles that we just talked about. There, you look, look for some patterns in these. So here we see the things that make up the first generation. Okay, in, in these, the electron, um, is the, is the lightest, and you have the up quark and the down quark. And these are all lighter, significantly lighter than the proton. The neutrinos in all generations are, are much smaller. So there's you know, 10 orders of magnitude uh, from the proton to here. And so that's a big mystery and something we don't understand uh, either. The second generation is heavier than the first generation. It, it has a similar pattern where the lepton, you know, the, the, the partner, or, or the, the equivalent of the electron, which is the muon, um, is lighter than the other than the other quarks, okay? But the the thing that would be analogous to the up quark is now heavier than the thing that would be the down quark. Okay, don't don't really understand that again. Um, and then the third generation is, is is heavier still. It also has this this the, the electron equivalent as the lightest part. Uh, but these are now you know much can be much heavier than the proton. So this this top quark is about 100 times heavier. Um, again, we, we have no real, no real understanding of this. So a lot, there was a lot of speculation at first about doing numerology on here, understanding if we can predict these, predict these, um, these patterns, and, and, and the, the theory that we have isn't able to do that at all. Where would the goetron be on that? So yeah, I'll come to the bosons next. So we have the W and the Z. These are very massive. So these are also about 100 times heavier than, than the proton. Uh, the photon and the gluon are massless, so they have no mass. Uh, the graviton would, would also live. Would also live here. We're going to talk about that. Um, so, I, so I said that the theory isn't able to predict these masses. So they're really inputs to the theory, right? So, so the theory is only able to make predictions once you know what these masses are, and these have to be determined from experiments. So we have to go out and measure <coughs> these things. Yeah, I also want to talk about the interaction strengths, right? So we have these diagrams. Um, so they like that that um, that look like these stick figures, okay, where the boson <coughs> interacts with matter. And associated with each of these little stick figure vertices is a number, okay? And that number tells you what the overall strength of the interaction is. So for the electromagnetic interaction, it's about one over 100. Uh, for, the, for the weak interaction, it's one over 50. And for the strong interaction, it's one over 10, okay? So, so not only are, do the forces all look, look alike in terms of these little stick figures, the, the actual numbers aren't so, aren't so different. Okay, and these numbers really set the overall strength of the interaction, and by that I mean we'll see this. We'll see this um, next slides. It's really directly related to the probability for a certain process to occur. So maybe we'll wait to the end to, to do question. Okay. So also these numbers are really input from the theories. Okay, the theory is not able to predict what these these should be. So we also have to need to we go out and measure these, and then we can use them as, as input for other calculations. Okay, so here's an example of how you might how we might do that. So a diagram like this of an electron uh, interacting electromagnetically with the proton um, would, would set the various properties of the atom. Okay, so for instance, the, the size of an atom is dictated by diagrams that look like this. So what we would do is we would measure those properties of the atom, and from that we can infer what this strength of this coupling would be. Uh, then we can input that to other calculations. So, so example here, how how electrons would scatter with with other electrons or with other positrons. Okay, so we, we talked very briefly at the beginning about how we can combine these stick figures to make um, make predictions of what the or calculate what the amplitude is. 
I want to talk about that in a little more detail here. And so again, we have these, these little stick figures that are pictures of what happens, um, but, they're, but, the, but they're also well-defined numbers associated with these that are, that are provided by the theory. Um, so in particular, the theory says for each of these vertices, we have to put in this coupling strength, actually the square root of that coupling strength. Um, and it also gives uh, factors for each of these lines. Okay, so there's a, there's a numerical um, you know, uh, functional form you put in for each of these lines. You multiply all that together, and that's the, that gives you the number um, for each of these diagrams. Okay, and of course, you need to remember that we have to, it's not just one stick figure, we have to, we have to think about the red blob, so we have to add all the other, all the other, all the possible ways that these can be connected. Um, so, but I said, I alluded to the fact that this is just one contribution to the amplitude. So to get the full amplitude, we have to sum, to sum all the, the numbers from all the diagrams. And so the other diagrams look like this. So they're, they're the same stick figure forms. They have the same vertices, except now there's these loops within the diagrams. Okay, and so it's really, to get the full amplitude, okay, this is the thing that we squared to get the probability, we have to add diagrams that only have, that have no loops, plus diagrams that have one loop, two loops, etc. Um, and so I have a couple things to point out here. One is that here you see that this is the vacuum fluctuations I was talking about. Right? So here, you know, you know, this is really a picture of a, a photon being emitted at one point in space here, going to a different point of, you know, traveling through an empty space and hitting the electron at a different point in space. And here what's happening is that, that photon seems to be propagating through empty space, but it has some energy, okay? It has some probability to, to, to convert into um, and uh, an electron and, a, and an anti-electron. Okay? Again, that's a direct, direct consequence of quantum mechanics and relativity. Okay? And then the other diagrams have two of these loops. Okay? Um, another thing that I'll point out is the theory tells us that associated with each of these loops is a factor that you put in. Okay? So this factor is one over, one over four pi, so this is like a tenth, and it also depends on uh, inversely on the mass of the part. So the, so the the, the contribution of heavier particles here is less likely. It contributes a, a smaller number. Okay, so really, in order to, ca to calculate this amplitude or this, the, this, this thing that gives us the probability, it's an infinite sum. We have to sum, you know, arbitrarily high number of loops. But in practice, only the first few terms are important, okay? And the, the reason you can see that is that this, that this term has two powers of this, this coupling. Okay, remember, this is a number that's like, one over 100, the things that have one, one loop have four of these vertices. Okay, so it's like one over 100 squared, so it's a smaller number. And they also have a smaller factor from this loop. Okay, so this loop gives a, a number that's also less than one. Things that would have two loops would have even more uh, vertices in them. They would have even more powers of this, uh, we, we call loop suppression. So those give even smaller numbers. So in practice, in order to calculate this, this um, amplitude to, to, high, to high precision, we only need to ever include, you know, up to two loops, maybe three loops, but we don't have to, we don't have to worry about the fact that, it is, that there isn't an infinite sum. But of course, in, in reality, these other terms are there. Okay, so that's one thing that the theory can do, predict probabilities for things, to, for things to interact. It can also predict basic properties of particles. Um, so I'll explain what, what I mean by that in the next slides. Um, so an example of, of a calculation that you can do with the theory is to predict um, what, the, what the corrections to the z mass. Okay, so here we also have we have terms that have no loops in them, plus contributions that have a loop, many other loops. And this is a number that, that as I said, is, is associated to the, the mass of the z that we have to just measure from experiment. Okay, but there's other terms that, that have that have uh, that have loops in them. And so again, this is a vacuum. This is really the, a, a vacuum uh, fluctuation, okay? And so these give these give contributions to what we measure as the uh, as the as the z mass. Okay, so the, if you if you pay attention to the earlier slides, you would think that this is impossible because the mass of the top quark is actually heavier than the mass of the z. So you, it, it seems like this violates uh, conservation of energy, um, but there's actually a probability for this to happen, and it's all because of the uncertainty principle that we, that we talked about earlier. Right, so if this happens for a small enough times, then you're allowed to have, you know, you can trade the uncertainty and the energy of this, this Z for, um, for uncertainty of, of producing this, uh, this, this correction. So it, it seems impossible, okay, to, like many things with quantum mechanics, 
Um, but it's true, and it has, con it has confirmed uh, observable consequences that we'll talk about um, in, in later slides. Okay, so, so really, you know, we started by talking about these forces that look very different to us, right? They have different, they seem to have different relationships. Um, but now we see with the theory that they're really, you know, for the first time, that they really are all described in the same language. So they all have these stick figures, and they all have, they're represented by strengths that are not so different, okay? So how do we, you know, how do we rationalize that with the fact that these forces look extremely different to us, right? They look totally, totally different. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about uh, with the remainder, remainder of today's, today's lecture. Okay, so I want to start first by uh, talking about the electromagnetic interaction, the electromagnetic strength. So, so again, this is something that we would have to, we have to measure from, from theory, or measure from experiment as an input to the theory. Um, and so one way you could do that is if you have an electron that's sitting here, this is now space and space, so um, you could measure the, 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 inter, the, the force, um, electromagnetic force is a function of distance. Okay, this would give the inverse square law. Um, and from that, you can determine what this, or infer what this coupling strength is, this alpha that's associated with the, the stick figure diagrams. And so in practice, what we do in order to, to measure this, we, uh, we start at, at relatively long distances. So this is now showing the strength of this interaction is a function of the distance with which you measure it at. Um, and so it seems to be constant, okay, at, 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 at distances that are large compared to, um, you know, the uncertainty, uh, which, which the uncertainty principle kicks in for the for mass of the electron. Okay, and this gives us this value that I talked about, this 1 over 137. Okay, however, as you get closer, as, as you try to measure, determine this closer and closer to this, this electron, you eventually get to the point where you need to put in so much energy that you can create out of the vacuum this electron positron pair. So this is exactly what we talked about um, last lecture. It's these, these, these quantum fluctuations of the vacuum. Okay, so when you get when you get down to these distances, these there's a significant probability for this this to happen. So you re, you really should think about you should think about this. the electron isn't just sitting here in empty space. It's surrounded by these pairs of um, these pairs of electron positrons popping in and out of the vacuum. Okay, so really, any measurement that you would do that at this distance scale would have to take these into account. Okay, so if you, if you would, for instance, shine a light and see how it interacts with this, with this central electron, there's a probability that it hits one of these guys instead. And so the effective force that you would measure, the effective strength, um, would be really a combination of all of these charges at this, at this distance scale. Now, of course, these things that are coming out of the vacuum, these, these um, so I draw the open circle as the antiparticle, closed circles of the particle, these also have charges, okay? So there's interactions between the, cent the central electron um, and these things that are popping out of the vacuum. And so that tends to polarize this, this, uh, this cloud. So, so the guys that, that uh, have positive charge, there's a higher probability for them to be closer to the electron than the guys with negative charge because there's a force, right? There's the electromagnetic force on them. So it turns out that if you would measure, if we measure the strength of the electric, electric charge with distance, it looks constant when you're out here. When you're very far from this cloud, um, it looks constant at this number. But once you get once you get within this cloud, okay, particularly once you get down here, you start you start seeing the bare charge. So outside of this radius, you're, the, this central charge is sort of screened by the fact that you have positive charges here as well. Right? And so when we get but when we penetrate this 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 cloud, then you know, we're only seeing the effect from this from this central electron, not these guys. Okay, so that so that has the effect that as we get to smaller distances, okay, distances that smaller than this um, that, that are shown here, it looks like the force the force gets stronger. Okay, it's 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 a gradual strength. It's not um, you know maybe it gets to it gets higher by about a factor two, um, but there's there's a, this is a real effect. Okay, the, the force gets stronger, and it's because of these these um, these vacuum um, you know these things coming out of the vacuum. Okay, and in fact, so if you, if you have this picture, you can do a lot of, you know, we can make a lot of calculations, not just calculating the force of the electromagnetic field, but other properties uh, of the electron, like I said. Um, one of them is the spin. So this electron has spin, so that means it's, it, you can think of it as like a little magnet sitting here. Um, and of course, these other things that are coming out of the vacuum would affect how much of the magnet that it looks like. And the theory is able to calculate that, right? And so here's, um, 
Here's a result of that. So it, it, it predicts the magnetic property. So this is a G factor. Don't worry about what the details is, are. But it ba basically, this is how much of a magnet it is, the magnetic strength okay, in some units. And the theory predicts very precisely, taking all these into account, okay, that <coughs> out to about, you know, I think there's 11 decimal places here. Okay, and this has been measured. We can measure this also very precisely. And this has been measured out to 11 decimal places. And this is the uncertainty on the last point. Okay, and so it agrees, um, it agrees to about one part in a trillion. So I think this is um, the most accurate agreement uh, with experiment uh, in, in science. And so you can see that it, you know, it's definitely on the right track. And if we didn't have these, if we didn't take into account the fact that this vacuum is fluctuating, this number would be totally, we would get this number totally, totally wrong. So it's a real effect, and they have observable, observable consequences. Okay, so now you know I, I just went through the song and dance that all the all the interactions are the same. So we could do play the exact same game with the strong with the strong force. Um, of course, the electron doesn't feel the strong force, so we have to do it with with the quark. But we could do the same game here. So again, I have a quark sitting here at the middle, and I'll measure the strength of the electromagnetic interaction as a function of how far I am away from it. And actually, the way that we measure this uh, from theory, or in experiment, it, to be input from theory, it starts at small distances. Okay, so that number one over a tenth um, is a number that's appropriate at, at very small distances when you're close to a quark. Okay, but the same—it's the same game always. Okay, so it's, it's really the same thing. As, but you have to consider the fact that you have at, at distances of one over the mass of the quark or the mass of the proton. They're not not so different. You can have the same effect that we had with the electrons, where you produce an anti-quark um, and a quark. And again, you would expect this, there to be some polarization in this as well. Um, however, uh, unlike for photons, the gluons, okay, the things that mediate this strong interaction, can't inter self-interact. Okay? So the, another way to say that is the gluons carry the charge that's associated with this vertex. Okay? Photons are not charged, so they don't, there's, there's no electromagnetic interaction between photons. But for gluons, that's not the, the case. So gluons carry the strong charge. And so you, ha you have diagrams that look like this. Okay? And so remember, these are also consistent with our laws of um, quantum mechanics and relativity. These are, bos these are bosons interacting. Right? So you, you can, we're allowed to have three bosons or four bosons interacting. Um, so this means, so this is really the difference. Okay? And this means that when you, when you, when you would measure this, this force as a function of distance, you have to include not only these the fact that you can produce electrons and positrons, or sorry, quarks and antiquarks out of the vacuum, but you can also produce these, these gluons and antigluons. Okay, there's, 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 there's an effect for this to happen as well. Um, and so the theory has to include these. And so if you include these calculate, if you include those in your calculation, you end up getting a different sign. Okay, you get a different sign for how the, for how the force changes the distance. Now this is, you know, you get, there, there's no real deep reason for why you get this sign. Just, you do the calculation, it comes out this way. It has to do with you know, the charges that are associated with these and the fact that you have these loops. And so it turns out that as you go to, remember with the, with the, electro, with the electromagnetic force, as we went to larger distances, the force decreased to the value of 1 over 37. Here what happens is it starts at this value of 1 over 10. And as you go to bigger distances, it looks like the force is increasing. So the strength of this uh, interaction here, this 1 over 10, 1 over 10 at small distances, when you get to distances that are comparable with the, the size of the proton, it becomes, it becomes much stronger. Okay? It actually gets to the point where it becomes 1. Right? So not only does it get big, it gets, it, it gets really big. Um, and this has a lot of, this has a lot of, uh, a lot of consequences to our everyday life. For instance, well, so this is really what sets the, this is really what sets the, the light scale of protons. Okay, so I'll, I'll just talk about that here. So, we said a proton is consisted of, consists of a uh, quark, so there's really there's actually three quarks within a proton. Okay, but because you have these 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 vacuum uh, fluctuations, you should think of the there are these these loop you know these gluon loops and uh, quark anti quark loops living in the proton. And at, at these distance scales, there's a very high probability for this to happen. That strength is high. Okay, and so. Um, this is the reason why we, we, we don't observe quarks outside of the proton. So if you were going to take a quark to bigger, bigger distances, the amount of energy you would need to put in to counteract this strength of this force is enough to create uh, quark and anti-quark out of the vacuum. Okay? So what we say is that 
this leads to the fact that quarks and gluons are confined. Okay, the, strength, the, the strength of the interaction between them is so strong that if we, would, if we would try to pull them out, we would have to put in so much energy that we could create them, you know, that there's a probability to pull them out of the vacuum. And because, the, because that probability is one, it always happens. Okay, so we never see quarks outside of the, the proton or uh, neutron is uh, same, essentially the same. Okay, and this is what sets the size of protons. Okay, so the, when, when, this, when this strong interaction becomes one, it becomes, you know, the probability for you to produce these pairs out of the vacuum becomes, becomes uh, one. That's at a distance that gives you the, the proton, um, the size of the proton. And, and this is also what gives, you, gives us most of the mass in the universe. Okay, so associated with these, uh, with the energy of these guys, um, there's kinetic energy associated with these guys. And if a proton is just sitting there, uh, that shows up as mass energy for the proton. Okay, so the reason, so, so the, the reason that the strong interaction only operates on short distance scales and looks so different to us than the, than the electromagnetic interaction is because, because of this effect. Because the strength of the force changes with a, with a relative sign to the, to the electromagnetic interaction. Okay, so now I want to go back to the electromagnetic interaction. I'll, I'll discuss the differences between that and the weak interaction. Um, okay, so I talked about diagrams like this are responsible for the electromagnetic force. So how can we see that we get an inverse? We can get an inverse square law from this type of type of uh, diagram. So the basic way to, to see that is if we have an electron sitting here, there's some you know there's this there's this uncertainty associated with uh, how well we know its energy and how well uh, we know its the time at which with which we know that energy or Another way to say that is the, is the, the position that we know this electron. So you know, this is again this basic quantum mechanical uncertainty principle. Um, and so that is saying if, we, if, if this photon has, has an energy and a distance that is, that is smaller than this basic bound set by quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, there's a high probability for that to happen. Okay, so another way of saying that is if, the, if this photon has energy um, times, times the distance or how far it travels uh, is less than this bound, Okay, then, then it's not prevented by, by the uncertainty principle. Okay, and now we can write this in a different way. So this, um, this inequality can give us this inequality. This, the range of this photon is set by, again, these, these, these fundamental constants and the energy which the photon has. Okay, this is the upper bound for how far the photon can, can travel. Um, now, of course, the photon has no mass, so it's really this energy is it's, it's all from it's all from its momentum. Okay, none of it is from the, the mass. So this bound is set by the momentum that this photon has. Okay, so again, when this um, get from a diagram, it looks just like this. So this this is saying that this upper bound can be arbitrarily large. So if it's this photon, if the momentum goes to zero, then this upper bound goes to infinity, right? And so another way of saying that is. You can have a diagram like this where this photon travels very far, infinitely far, if it has very small momentum. Okay, that's consistent with the uncertainty principle, and there's a, there's a high probability for that diagram um, when you do the calculation. Now this, now this, as we talked about in the first lecture, the force is associated with the change of momentum. So when this photon hits, you can think of it like when this photon hits this quark, uh, it will give all its momentum to this quark, and that will we can interpret that as the force on the quark, right? And so when they're very far away, this momentum has to go to zero, and this force is getting smaller. Okay? Uh, but it can extend to infinity, right? And so this is exactly what you, gives you the inverse square law, right? So the inverse square law tells us that the, that the force, there's no upper limit to how far the force goes, but it gets weaker and weaker. Right? So as, as this distance gets bigger and bigger, this momentum has to get smaller and smaller, and that means the force on the, the core gets, gets smaller. Okay, but this is exactly what we'd expect from the inverse square law. Okay, now for the weak force, we have a diagram that looks the same, right? So we, we saw this earlier. So we, you can have an electron that uh, sends a C particle to a quark, um, and it's exactly the same, exactly the same calculation. Um, the only difference, and really the only difference here, besides you know a numerical factor here, is that the Z has a mass. Okay, so it's not massless like the photon. Okay, so let's do the calculation again. It's the same. It's the same exact thing. So this, uh, when this C particle has an energy times a distance that's less than what you would expect by the uncertainty principle, 
Um, there's a high probability for this to happen, so that means that, that this, this thing can travel a distance with upper limit set by one over the energy. Uh, but now here's where the difference comes in. Because this has a mass, the energy has the piece that we had before that was due to the momentum, but it also has the piece that's due to the mc squared of the z, the z particle. So now we can do the same game. We can try to get, you know, just as we tried to get the biggest possible distance for this photon, we can try to get the biggest possible distance for the z. So that happens. We can't change the mass of the z, so we can, but we can have this be as, this momentum as small as, as we like. Um, when that happens, this term goes to, you know, this this becomes zero, but this stays there. Okay. So there's always this one over mc um, on this side. Okay. So that means. In effect, we can't. This this can't be. This doesn't go to infinity, right? This this um, what's in the denominator here can't, doesn't go to zero as it did before, uh, and so that means that the, this weak force that's mediated by the z doesn't travel uh, long distances. Okay, so it, it cannot extend to, um, to infinite radius with high probability, uh, and this is what makes this is what makes the weak force short range. So the, the fact that we don't we don't see the weak force on strong distances is, is all due to the fact that that this z particle has a mass. Okay, other than that, they're really, it's really the same, exact same interactions. Okay, so, so really, you know, I, I said it before and I'll, and I'll say it again, but this is really the reason why we do, do particle physics, okay? So we, we had, this is the first time that we see these forces that are all incredibly important to our everyday lives that look totally different from one another. They actually look, they're described in the exact same way. Okay, they're described by the same sorts of diagrams, numbers that aren't so different from one another. And the fact that they look different to us is really just a long distance illusion. So as we go to smaller and smaller distance scales, things that naively appear to us to look very different seem to be unified. They seem to be really the same aspects of the same fundamental thing with, with minor differences. Okay? Um, and so the fact, that, the fact that to us there's this illusion that they look, look different is really due to these differences in, you know, subtle differences in the theory that we think aren't, in the end, so important. So the strong interaction, um, that's because you have this anti-screening, so the, the, the strength of the interaction grows with distance. This is a result of the fact that these gluons can interact with themselves. Okay? The weak force looks different, um, for different for a different reason. It's because the z particle has a mass. Okay, but when you, get the, when you get to energies where that mass is small compared to the momentum, that isn't important, and these, look, these really do look the same. Okay, so at short distances, so when distances are less than this, this mass scale, um, or the distance scale set by the mass of the C, these really start to all look the same. Okay, so again, this, you should have this picture of Newton's, Newton's dream. As we go to smaller and smaller distances, things that are, that are naively very different uh, are becoming, are, be, are being expressed in the exact same language and, and uh, starting to converge in, in, in a common way. Okay, so that's what I said. This is the reason we built build colliders. It's, it's not really to find all these different particles, it's to understand, it's to see this unity in, in everything around us. Okay, and this unity is apparent on small scales. Okay, so the, so just to conclude, um, so the standard model, uh, it, it took its modern form in the in the 19th century. It's really, this is the this is the stage on which the Higgs boson um, will, will, will act. Uh, took its modern form in the 60s and 70s, so since then it's been, it's been really confirming the, the details of this and, uh, and understanding what, what, what are the sorts of matter particles that are around, uh, but really the laws and the interactions were developed then. Uh, it is very predictive, so not only does it make a lot of predictions, uh, it makes very precise predictions. So it says that you, can, you should get to very high, um, very high precision, and those, those precise predictions have shown to be accurate. Okay? We can also measure a lot of these things to very very high precision in experiments, and there's always agreement. Okay, now, it's, it's also, the thing that I, that I should have stressed earlier is that if someone comes along and shows that the standard model doesn't work, they become famous, okay? So there's generations of physicists since the 60s and 70s trying to break this. So trying to stretch it to its extremes, um, and it, it, has never, it hasn't failed yet, okay? So it's a really robust, robust remarkable, uh, re remarkable theory. Um, it, is, it gives us a consistent theory of the electromagnetic strong and uh, weak forces, so all the forces that are relevant to, to uh, subatomic particles. Um, and so it's consistent as long as everything is massless. Okay? So as long as all the matter and the force carriers have no mass, 
This theory is consistent. Now, this is a big problem, okay? Of course, we just went through the song and dance. The difference between the weak force and the electromagnetic force is the mass of the Z. And it turns out that, in a real sense, if you, if you have a massive either matter or even or force carriers, uh, more, you can see it more clearly with force carriers, the theory is inconsistent. Okay, and by that I mean when you calculate these amplitudes, you get numbers that are bigger than one. Okay? Uh, and so that's a big problem because if you square a number that's bigger than one, you get another number that's bigger than one, and that number is supposed to be a probability. Okay? And probabilities bigger than one make no sense. Okay, so this is a crisis, this is a, this is a serious problem. Um, matter has, not only does it have mass, it has a large range of mass, and mass is critical for understanding the things around us, right? If, if things didn't have a mass, um, well, we'll talk about this in detail in the next lecture. Um, if these particles didn't have a mass, uh, the world will look radically different from the way it looks. Right? So the weak force will look exactly like the strong, the electromagnetic force. Um, that, that you know. Um, and so there's a serious problem here. This theory is inconsistent, given what we know about the mass of these inputs from theory. Um, and this is really uh, this is really where the Higgs comes in, and this is where we'll pick up pick up next time. Say if this 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 is this is what you ask. So I think the question is, what is the significance of the term force carrier, and who came up with it? Is that is that right? So yeah, I don't know. I definitely don't know who came up with the term. Um, but but all I mean by that is associated with each of the forces that we have. As I said, there's this little there's these little stick figure diagrams, um, and in those stick figures, one of them is a boson. And that boson is, is, is it, we say, it's the force carrier. So by that we mean the electromagnetic force is a result of one electron sending a boson to another electron. And so we, in that sense, we say it carries the force. I understand that, but I'm thinking in terms of the physics and Yeah, so, so really the emphasis of, of particles came into the game when we, we combined the quantum, me quantum mechanics with relativity. So that was the for first time where it was really forced upon us that it that had to be a particle. Um, I don't know so much of the history of this. I can, I can look, I'm happy to look it up for you and, and find that. I know Steven Weinberg, one of the guys where I'm taking a lot of this, has, has a wonderful book about the discovery of subatomic particles where he really goes in, into detail about this. You know, I think it, it's, it's, you know, I'm presenting this as a very clear... You know, obvious picture. This was very confusing, especially in the the mid the mid um, the mid twentieth century. We discovered the the photon. It wasn't clear how it, how it fed in with the rest of the theory. But but he does a really good job of saying how it's, how this was all sorted out and and what we actually you know what we now um, how we now think of these things. So in one of your first slides today, you have a, a remark that says that the strong force is responsible for nearly all the mass of matter. Yeah. And uh, so I want to get ask a question revolving around that. So from a classical concept, I think of mass, of, of the mass of a bowling ball as opposed to a golf ball, is larger because it has more of these particles that are uniform in some sense, at, a, at some basic level. Right. And that would suggest that the mass is a property of the particle itself. Um, and then I read something by one of the architects of quantum mechanics who says that mass should only be thought of as resistance to acceleration and nothing more. So in other words, the first idea seems to be there's some stuff. That's a kind of a human level concept. There's stuff and more stuff. Yeah. So and then we, yeah, when yeah, you yeah. say that it's the force, yeah. it sounds that it's it's not the stuff, but something else other than the stuff. Yeah, so let me try so that. What is mass? Yeah. So mass is energy e equals mc squared, right? Um, and so that the, the reason, the difference between a bowling ball and a golf ball is the bowling ball has more 
more um, protons in it. Okay? Protons will make up most of the mass. Bowling ball has more protons, so it is more massive. Now you can ask, where does the mass of a proton come from? Okay, so a proton is <coughs> sitting there, and inside of it has these quarks whizzing around. Okay, and so you can think of the, the I mean, the way to think about it is the kinetic energy of the quarks is a, inside the proton is a form of energy. Okay? And so the, the energy that those, that the things that the proton are made of is the same as the energy of the proton. Okay? So those, uh, but now, of course, even if the proton is just sitting there, not moving, so the proton has no kinetic energy, it has the energy because all of these, all of these quarks are running around in it. Okay? And so that energy we interpret as a mass energy. Right, so if you're, only, if you're only thinking about, you know, of course, in, if, if you could go to really small distances, there is no proton, right? It's really just quarks running around. And those quarks have kinetic energy. But when we think about it in terms of the proton, then, then we're ignoring those quarks, and it, it, it looks like, almost like a temperature, right? And so it's the, the, the temperature of the room, but the temperature of the quarks within the, within the proton is giving it what we think, that, what we interpret as the mass of the proton. What about the W and Z? So the W and Z is different. So I said... Um, I said that, that most of the mass of everything, um, everything in our world comes from, um, comes from the strong force, this kinetic energy of the quarks, um, and that's responsible for almost all the mass in our everyday life. The mass of the elementary particles themselves, that's not true. So you can ask, you can ask your, what, you, what you should ask is, well, if you, you said that these quarks aren't made of anything, so where does their mass come from? And that I'll talk about in the next lecture. Is this outdated now? And I used to think that when the whole universe was a singularity, that there was only one force gravity, and after the Big Bang, the other forces distilled from there. Is that still current thinking? Right. So the question is, when the universe was a singularity, how do these, for how do these forces behave? So I don't want to talk about that at all, because I didn't talk about singularities. Um, we'll get to that towards the end of the, towards the end of the, yeah, I want to ask you answer this question that I was going to ask them. If that is true, then how could Einstein be right that gravity is just a distortion of space and time because there was no space and time, and yet there was gravity? Yeah, so these are these are really deep questions that that we don't even have the you know I, I haven't presented the language to think about these yet. So the question is, you know, how does gravity fit into this at very high energies? Um, it's something that. That, that we need to we need to talk more about the, the, the forces uh, before we can get at that. And another thing I'll say is that there's deep, there's mysteries there, so we don't have exact answers to those questions yet. Um, and, but I'll talk about this at the end of the, the end of the lecture series. You mentioned a number of inputs to the theory that right. uh, have to be determined by uh, measurement the amplitudes and masses of some of the particles. Is it expected that those will always have to be inputs, or are they expected that someday they might be outputs? Of Right, so that's a good question. So there's, um, so something I was debating about going into was the fact that because we only have these finite number of interactions, right, there's only three fundamental stick figures, that means there's a finite number of inputs to the theory. Okay, so that means that we can actually measure, you know, 20 numbers is enough to constrain everything. Um, and so that's actually a remarkable fact. It didn't have to be that way. So it couldn't, if all the diagrams were important, so if, the, if, a, if four of them meeting, at one point was important, and five meeting and six meeting, if they were all important, then we'd have to measure an infinite number of parameters, and it would be very hard to make predictions. So that's not the case. So there's only, there's only these three diagrams in the report, and we have three forces, we have a bunch of masses. So in the end, there's about 20 numbers that are input to the theory that we have to measure. Um, and so as far as the theory is concerned, these, are all, these will always be inputs. Now, of course, if we come up with another theory that's, that's an extension of the standard model, it's very possible that it can explain those numbers. So I'll give you an example. When we thought that when we thought that protons were fundamental, there we thought the mass of the proton was an input to the theory. Now, now that we think that protons are made of smaller entities, uh, we think that uh, or we can calculate. You know, there's, there's a real sense in which we can calculate the mass of the proton given the masses of the quarks. Now, you know, you can imagine uh, you can imagine a universe in which the, the things that we think are fundamental now are actually uh, not fundamental, they're made of other things. Maybe those things have no mass, so we don't have to, those, we don't need that input from the theory, and we can calculate everything. So I think that, you know, there's definitely, it's a dream of, of especially theorists, that, um, that there's no inputs needed from experimentalists, okay? Because they don't, they, then they won't have to talk to us. Um, and, but that's not, um, you know, that might be a goal for some, but that's not uh, the way the standard model is. Okay, 
Okay, there's another question here. Uh, you mentioned that the strong force was known since, I think you said, the early 1900s. Yeah. What were you referring to there? Right, so it, it wasn't, so the strong force actually, it, because it's so strong, it's really hard to, to do these, uh, to make these calculations. So when I show these diagrams, I show that the, you know, the, 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 the things with higher loops are suppressed because they have many vertices and those vertices have a small number. But when you're at very large distances, the strong interaction, that, that number becomes like one. And so then all the diagrams are important. So it's really hard to do calculation, it's really hard to make calculations. And so it's actually, it, it, the strong force, the, the mathematical form it took came, came you know, very late to the game. Um, but what was known, in, what I alluded to in the early 1900s is when we discovered the nucleus, we knew that there, were, there had to be some, we knew that the nucleus had, was made of things that were both positively charged. So that was a big hint that there had to be something else holding those things together. And there were even theories that predict sort of like inverse square laws with, with a force that's now known to be just a very residual uh, effect of the strong interaction. Where when you're exchanging things like pions or other, other particles, you can get an effective force. And so that was, you know, there were, there were definitely mathematical models for that that gave reasonable predictions uh, in the early part of the, the 1900s. So we knew, we knew there had to be something there. But the strong interaction was something that, that came much, 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 much later than that. How can a particle be considered fundamental if it can decay? Right. How can a particle be considered fundamental if it can decay? Um, so there's, you know, you should think of it as the, you know, it's quantum mechanical, right? So there's, there's, you know, we saw that diagram for the, um, for the. Uh, Okay, so there's this, there's this diagram. So, so, so this is really an electron changing form, okay? So it's changing from uh, an electron to a neutrino. Uh, as I said, that there's things called muons that look exactly like an electron. So there would be the same diagram where this is a muon. And so what I could do is I could connect this end to an electron and a neutrino. Okay, so there's some probability that uh, a, a muon coming along can, can turn into a neutrino, uh, another neutrino, and an electron. Okay, and the idea is that if you have a, if you have a muon sitting here, there's a, there's a probability for that to happen. And if you wait long enough, it will happen. And once that happens, it's, it's very hard to go back because you need to put three of these together, right? There'd have to be a neutrino here, a neutrino there, and an electron there. Um, and that's, there's not a vertex for that. So, so these are things that can go one, easily go one way, and it's hard to go the other way. If you have a lot of energy, they can go back and forth. Um, but but if, it's, if it's just sitting there, then, then there's a probability for that to happen. And my question is, if a particle can decay, that means it's somehow composed. It's the composition of some things. No, 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 no. It's it's. Remember, you can create things out of the vacuum, out of the vacuum, right? So, so that it's not like, you know, it's not like this neutrino is within this electron, right? It's it's that that that, 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 that there's that, that there's an interaction here where you're really creating a neutrino and you're creating a W. So, so the the, the thing that was an electron is no longer there, and now there's there's a neutrino and and a W boson. Okay, but there's no there's no sense in which in which inside uh, inside of the electron these things exist. There's just a probability for this this to occur. If the electron didn't simply disappear and the other two things appear, there had to be something continuous during the process. What is continuous there? So what's continuous is the energy. The, the energy is continuous. So the question was is there has to be something continuous when you, when you do this. And yeah, the energy is continuous. The charge is also continuous. So you can look at this and you can say, you know, if this electron, if this electron splits into a neutrino and a W and this has a positive charge, this guy's neutral, this guy has to have a positive charge. So the, the, you know, the, the, the conserved quantities are continuous, but the, there's, no, there's no useful sense in which you should think of the electron as composed of these other things. Okay, so maybe we'll take just two more questions and then... Just cut one question. How do you get, say, uh, oscillation into this uh, neutrino oscillation between right. the three types of neutrinos? Yeah, so the, the question is about neutrino oscillation. Um, so, and how does that show up in the scheme? 
Uh, do I want to answer that here? I probably don't want to answer that, so I'm not gonna. I, I, I can talk to you after. Okay, it's um. Yeah, I'll talk to you after. So maybe one more question, and then we can. Then we'll talk. Just, just one quick one. All these diagrams, these particles are changing into other. These things are changing into other things. Is all the energy self-contained in each of these units, particles, or is it also drawing some extra energy from the vacuum space? Okay, so the question is about energy. Where does the energy live in these diagrams? Is it, is it contained within the lines? And so remember, these lines are these lines are sort of you know, ways of thinking about what's happening. Really, you should think that there's these fat red. Right. Those, those fat red diagrams that I had. But yeah, I mean, when we think of, when we think of, if, if we have a particle that, let's take this example. If you have a particle that emits a, that, that emits a, um, a Z and continues along, then, then this electron, after it emits the Z, has less energy than this electron. So, so, so the energy is in the particle. So the particles have the energy. Now, of course, this, this Z can go along and give energy to the vacuum and create two other particles. Um, but, the, but the energy resides uh, you know, in these diagrams in, in the particles themselves. Okay, so maybe, um, so maybe we'll, we'll stop there. If you have further questions, I'm happy to, uh, to talk to you after.